Yeah. Still, we are part of it. It's in our training. It's in our lack of civic responsibility. I have a question. You mentioned that British and England, they decided the Shah must go. And there was no alternative but Khomeini. If, just hypothetically, U.S. and England, they kept their mouth shut, what would have happened? The question, Hypothetical what question. would have happened if U.S. and Britain had kept their mouth shut? Uh, U.S. and Britain did not keep their mouth shut for one major reason. The Shah had, was falling to pieces. The Shah was demanding their advice, quote unquote advice. Someone gave me a tape of an interview with a journalist, with the Shah, a few months, uh, in fact, I think maybe it's shorter than a few months, a few weeks before his death. Uh, <clears throat> the text has never been published. Uh, and the, he showed it to me on the condition that I don't name him but he allowed me to quote from it, and I have quoted in the book. There's a wonderful section, and clearly, this journalist doesn't really know much about Iran. So he asked the Shah, he says, when you saw these problems, why didn't you act earlier? Why didn't you bring the military, for example? Uh, he says, well, uh, I wasn't getting the right advice from the Americans. Uh, the guy says, well, uh, so what if you weren't getting the advice? Your country, why were you needing the advice of the Americans? The Shah says, well, you obviously don't understand diplomatic decorum. I thought the Americans were my friend. And I wasn't getting the advice. I was getting one advice from Brzezinski and one advice from Sullivan, and I couldn't decide. The guy comes back to him and says, look, uh, I know your majesty, but you were the sovereign of the country, not Brzezinski. So what if Carter Ford got to call you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Shah didn't have it in him to manage a crisis. At times of crisis, he broke down. He almost broke down in 53. He did break down in 53. And the combination of Kashani, Allah, the American embassy, uh, supporters of Britain that were in Iran, and Bazaris, uh, Sardar Fakhir Hikmat saved them. Otherwise, the Shah would have been gone in 53. People don't know how much the Shah tried to escape in 53. In February 53, Mossad comes to him and says, I think you better leave the country. He says, sure, I'll leave. When do you want me to leave? <laughs> Mossad says, I'll bring your passport the day after tomorrow, and I don't want you to make an announcement. Leave quietly. <laughs> and leave with a car. He says, I'll do it. On the day he was supposed to leave, in the meantime, Allah finds out. And Allah tells the American embassy. Allah tells Qabam. Allah tells uh, everybody. Everybody begins to act. Kashani, on the morning of February 11th, convenes a special session of the parliament to pass a law requesting His Majesty not to leave. The Shah tells Allah, I want to leave before they convene. I don't want them to come here and tell me not to go. I want to go right now. And it is Allah and uh, the American Embassy and Kashani and these guys who hold him long enough so that people can come. They bring about 10, 5,000, I don't know, large number of people right outside the part of the court. They shout and they watch out. They don't want you to leave. And he gets a new spirit and decides to stay. The same is on August. In August 15, when he hears that Nasiri has been arrested, without saying a word, he gets on his plane and leaves. And leaves the people who were with him in that chalet in Kalardash. What would have happened if he had stayed? Mossad never told the Iranian people that the Shah had actually issued an order dismissing him. What if he had stayed? And next day, gone in front of the public and said, I've issued a statement, I've issued, I've dismissed this guy. There is no parliament, there is the Orani Fetrat, and I have the constitutional right to dismiss this guy. 
there is a letter I have found from Mossadegh to the Shah that says, during Fetra, there's, when there is no parliament, you have the right to make recess appointments. So what would have happened if he had appeared in a press conference, brought out Mossadegh's letter, says, according to this letter, Mossadegh knows himself that I have the right to dismiss him. I've dismissed him. He has arrested the person that I have sent to give him the letter. What would have happened? We don't know, because he left. Now, all of us would like to either blame, uh, you know, Kim Roosevelt or Mossadegh for all of these things, but it is a very much more complicated issue, and each of us as citizens of that country, I think, are responsible for what happens to it. I hate to ask look the look, uh, I, mean, uh, I, I want to go to another person. Look, you know, look at uh, today, right now. Everybody keeps talking about the role that the Americans have in this, <coughs> the spoiler, Britain is a spoiler. There are two million Iranians outside Iran. There has <coughs> not yet been a demonstration of larger than 20,000 people against this regime, which everybody claims in private to be against. 20,000. In New York, where there are four million Jews, living. And Ahmadinejad, who is a Holocaust denier, comes to New York. We can't organize 50,000 people there. What role does the American have to do in the whole of this? It's us that haven't done it. And unless we understand that we are the only ones who decide, we are going to sit around and happily, you know, the conspiracy theory and the theory that there is a spoiler has one purpose. And I have found evidence that it came to Iran at the same time that opium came to Iran. <laughs> <laughs> I really mean that. Opium smoking came to Iran mid-19th century. There was eating it before. There's a brilliant book by uh, a historian called the Pursuit of Pleasure in Iran, uh, Rudy Matt. Uh, and he says, Iranians learn how to smoke this damn thing in mid 19th century. It's mid 19th century that conspiracy theory, that's the English begins to come. They do the same thing. They give you false comfort. They tell you that you didn't make the mistake. Somebody else did. I'm sorry. You had your hand. Yes. So, shall, shall we take one more question and sure. then we probably should leave Professor Milani off the road because he has another appointment also. Is it all right? Please. Yeah. Excuse me. My name is Saudi Hassuna. I'm a visitor here. And I enjoyed your lecture so much. It's very good. Very informative. However, I have to I have a question and a remark. Now I start with the remark. I was uh, going to school in 1956-57. And in 1962, after the election of President Kennedy, the Shah had made a visit with his wife uh, to the United States. And the purpose of that was um, an aid requirement or something like that. And the Washington Post, there was a column in it published. I don't recall who uh, wrote that, but uh, it was in the uh, Washington Post. And I read it with the dean of students together who were having coffee at the student union. And I brought it to his attention. And he said, Saudi, you're not a politician. You are a student. Anyway, uh, the article or this column, it said, well, look, he's coming to ask for aid. And his wife is wearing a 25 million dollars worth of jewelry. Okay, well, that, that's the remark that I remember. Now, but my question is this. Now, from the lecture here, I understand two things. Now, the communists, at times of Mossadegh, I was 14, maybe 15 at that time. Okay, and I remember quite a bit of the, uh, of whatever, what have transacted at that time. And um, of course, I understand from the lecture that the communists, the Soviet Union, had an interest 
and they wanted to support Musatta. Now, the British and the Americans had also um, uh, interest. Now, who had, excuse me, who had... The British were acknowledged. No, no, no. Who, <laughs> <laughs> who had the love and the interest and the welfare to the Iranian people at that time? The British and CIA, and you know CIA had uh, a quite bit of a role in uh, reversing Mossadegh's uh, movement. And who has actually the love for the brown eyes of the Iranian people? Uh, was it was it was it the British and the CIA or the communists? This is my question. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you very much for your kind words. Uh, in about the jewel, I, I don't know what piece of jewelry she was wearing. About <laughs> million. Uh, I don't think there was a jewel in the royal. Excuse me. That, that was in the. Uh, I, I know. I understand. Uh, that, right? Washington Post. Yes, I understand me. that. I understand that. Uh, but interestingly, uh, I called uh, a letter from the White House. It's in the book. Uh, to the court, Iran's court. Uh, you know, the Kennedys didn't want to invite the Shah. And there's a whole history there that I described. The Kennedys hated the Shah, particularly Bobby Kennedy. Uh, and Bobby Kennedy hated him because Bobby Kennedy had two people who had told him about the Shah. One of them was Justice Douglas. The Excuse me, doctor, doctor, but the Shah was in the United States. I know. That if you have patience, I will. One, whether he was if you uh, have invited patience. or otherwise, but he was here. If you have patience, sir, sure. I will answer your question. I'm sorry. If you want, I will wait till you answer your phone. And then I will <laughs> You're the only person whose phone keeps ringing. <laughs> and you question me for it. taking too time. long to answer your question. <laughs> Just, well, yeah, I know, but yes, I understand that. Uh, um, there is a button that if you push, it won't, it won't ring anymore. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, eventually, they agreed to invite him. Uh, one of the letters they wrote to the shop, they said, when you come here, we don't want you to wear any military uniforms. We don't want your wife to wear expensive jewelry because it will create a negative in image. So having received that letter, I personally doubt she was she would have worn twenty five. He had I said two Kennedy had two advisors. One of them was Justice Douglas. The other one was a young man, at that time a student, by the name of Wot Zadeh. Wow. Wot Zadeh used to brag this family is very popular. <laughs> the number of rings the two of you have gotten is more than I get in a lifetime. Uh, well, no, I understand. I'm working along. Uh, I just want to have fun with it. Both uh, there was the other. Both Sade used to brag about having the private number of Kennedy. And this goes so far that a senator writes a letter to the White House, actually and says, what kind of a government are you guys running? <laughs> this Bozadeh is a two-bit hoodlum. How uh, come the Saudi Arabian ambassador in, in, in Washington was called so-and-so uh, Bush? Uh, yes, you well, you're moving, yeah. yes, yeah. you're moving forward about 40 yeah, years. Exactly. <laughs> uh, the Saudi Arabian, yes, but, uh, the Saudi uh, Arabian allow me. Yeah, allow ambassador me. to Washington Sir, uh, I think you have overused your uh, yeah. prerogative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. uh, he writes a letter to, uh, to the White House and says, what kind of government are you? This guy keeps going around and says, I'm directly connected to Bobby Kennedy. And this is the incredible line. Those of you who believe in conspiracy theories, you would love this line. He says, he tells everybody that the Americans are going to make me a minister in Iran one day. <laughs> Fast forward 30 years, and he was a minister. On that happy note, thank you. <laughs>